<laughs> Just make sure you can hear me properly. Check one, two. Thank you very much, Brother Harold. Good morning, church. We're still morning. Hallelujah. But the same time limit? All right. No, I not think was the plan to expand much longer, but I just wanted to be obedient. Hallelujah. God is good. Hallelujah. God is faithful. Let's just pray. Jesus, we thank you because you are faithful, God. And we honor your name this afternoon. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity to break bread with your people. And God, even as we break bread together, Lord, I pray that whatever we have them to digest this morning, it will bring full nourishment to our spiritual bodies. Lord, I pray for those online. I pray, Lord, for connectivity. I pray for clarity. And Lord, I pray that I won't de declare what you want me to. Nothing more and nothing less. I will just commit everything to you, King Jesus. In mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Welcome to those of you who are online. And I pray indeed that even as you have tuned in the God with ministry, not only you, but your families as well. This morning we are in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 6. Hallelujah. And if I'm to give a title to what I'm sharing on this morning, I said it's a working title. We respond to what God is saying in this season. We're living in very interesting times. There's a lot happening. A lot that can... We quite con that is quite concerning. And I know a lot of us have questions. I mean, one of the questions I, I've heard a lot when talking to Christians, what's God saying to the church globally? What's he saying to the church in the Caribbean region, South America? What are you saying to the church in Guyana? What are you saying to the church at South Road for Gospel Assembly? And what is he saying to me as an individual? What is he saying to you as a believer? And I'm more, more getting more convinced that God's not saying anything vastly different <laughs> to all to all these situations. And I but really, it's I knew what to preach on, and I had several messages perhaps lined up. And then I just got an inkling to go back to one of my favorite passages of Scripture, which is Isaiah 6. And I spent a lot of time in it before, and I've written about it. Yet I've gone back to it, and I saw some new things. And I hope this morning that I'll be dropping some nuggets. And as we go through... I hope something will minister to you. Amen? Just for some context before I read um, from the text. We all know Isaiah is one of the primary prophets in the Bible. So we, say that we have minor prophets, major prophets. He's a major prophet. And he probably said a lot about Christ and the coming of Christ. But when you look at Isaiah's history, it's quite a remarkable story because when we look at even various position, he was positioned in the courts next to, um, close to the king at the time. He had royal connections. He was also a renowned prophet, solid prophet, yet we have here in Isaiah 6, as some Bibles have captioned, Isaiah's commission. I'm not saying he wasn't a prophet before, but there was something in his journey that happened and transformed his life. And that's where I'm going to pick it up this morning. So Isaiah 6 verse 1. 
In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. I'm going to stop right there. I just read back that verse so many times. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. And I'm going to just pull out some things there. If we study Isaiah's life, we realize that Uzziah, the king at the time, well, who had just died, was in fact a relative of his. He was also one of those kings that served a long time, for over 50 years, I think 52 to be exact. And his legacy is both good and bad. He made some good, he did some good things and he did some not so good things. And then he eventually he was judged by the Lord. So what we have here is a, a moment of, in time being captured by Isaiah. In this particular year, in this particular time in my life, I saw the Lord. But I believe this morning, brothers and sisters, at us at this particular junction time, that Uzziah represents, or possibly could represent more than just a marker in time. For Isaiah, Uzziah represented the known, the familiar. He was a, a relative he was in good standing with, something loved, something cherished, maybe something comfortable. And then all of a sudden, all these symbols of stability were removed from his life. And I'm sure Isaiah had questions. There was uncertainty. He probably didn't know what his next step or steps were to be. But it cho God chose this time to reveal himself to him. And that caused a transformation in his life, in his ministry. Brothers and sisters, one of the ways God has of getting our attention is by making us uncomfortable. And when we are in these moments of discomfort, he forces us to adjust, or we may, he doesn't force us to adjust. He asks us to adjust. And if we don't respond accordingly, where we will be disobedient for, we will be disobedient first of all. But beyond that, we also run the risk of becoming irrelevant. We're in the midst of a pandemic and the world has already changed. And we hear often the new normal or people are waiting for the normalcy to return. But the world has already changed. <laughs> and now is a time when God expects us to adjust accordingly. God doesn't change. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So we have to be worried about that. But we have to be obedient to what he is saying to us at this particular time. To make adjustments necessary. Church today is not what church was back in the day. Church has evolved so much. And as a ministry and as individuals, God will be trying to get our attention and say, no, now is the time to make adjustments in your life. Whether personally, whether as a church, God may make us uncomfortable. We only have to rely on his way, his direction, his path. But unlike us, God is not unsure about the future. He knows the future. So we can be confident that God has a plan. We can rest assured that God has a plan. He's not calling us to do something because... He, 
as a guessing game. He knows the end from the beginning. I remember David told a story, told us a story last year. David, my brother, he works um, well as a doctor and he's leading up the team in COVID team in Jamaica. But they had an issue at work, and I think the manager is trying to divide his team. So they asked the doctors a question, and they said, "Whatever Doctor McGowan says, we will do." So they asked them, they asked them "So if Doctor McGowan tells you to jump over the bridge, will you jump over the bridge?" And they said, "Yes." Because that means he has a plan. <laughs> That's a human. Humans having confidence in a man who is a supervisor that he has something worked out. Much more God, the creator of heaven and earth, who knows everything, who has everything in his palm of his hands. Our confidence is not in flesh not in governments, not in the systems of this world. I mean, not knocking them. They all have the rules to play and they're all important. But our trust is in the living God. He reigns forevermore. Hallelujah. So God wants us to respond to what they're receiving. There's some adjustments that have to be made. And we don't need to fight it. You just got to move with the cloud. You no know, one of the things I, I when I, I think back about the children of Israel and how fortunate they were, that God was with them everywhere, <laughs> directing them. But yet they were so resistant and they had the doubts about what was going on. Might be a cloud and fire and God bringing direction, God providing everywhere. And then you become ungrateful. And don't do, be like that. When God wants our attention, let us respond. God is in fact speaking now. And as his children, we need to respond. Hallelujah. Let's continue. I saw the Lord seated on the throne, high and exalted. And the train of his robe filled the temple. I want to just, as I said, just not be reminded that in the midst of all the confusion, all the things that seem to be going off, whether the, it's a local COVID situation, where the policies that we don't seem to, we don't like that are maybe anti God, that are anti God, and Paul, things happening in Haiti or in Afghanistan and all over the world, be reminded that the Lord remains high and exalted and the train of his robe fills and fills the temple. How do you see God today? He is not a puny weakling. He is the almighty God who is able, who is willing, and who is fighting for us, who has not lost control of the plot. Lord reigns. And let the earth rejoice. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Can you give God praise? Hallelujah. Praise God. Verse 2. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet. And with two, they were flying. And let go verse 3. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. There's a lot in verse 2 that we can perhaps expound on, but I want to go there. This morning I asked two questions. In fact, I, I've seen this verse and I never really studied it as much as I should have. But one thing that stood out to me in this scripture, they were, a, verse 2, above him, the king on the throne, were seraphim, 
and what they were doing. I noted that the angels were positioned strategically and were deliberate in their actions. And we can learn a very important principle from the angels and ask these two questions. Where are you positioned? What are you doing? I'm going to repeat that. Where are you positioned? What are you doing? These are angels of the Lord who knew what they had to do and they were doing it. Some, there are too many people in God's kingdom who are out of position and not doing what they're supposed to be doing. Too many of us are out of position. And what makes it worse, many, many of us who are out of position, we love to grumble. We love to complain. We love to see all that is wrong. We always know what should be done. We have all the wisdom Or we think we have all the wisdom, I should say. But God is not for people. God doesn't want to be out of position. Whatever God is saying to you, respond appropriately. Respond in obedience. Get in line. Do what you ought to do. I, I, I referenced this story this morning. I'm um, Pastor um, Bobby Gilbert. One of his members who complained that the church was a lot of cobweb and that the people weren't doing the job properly. So he told her, he said, he told her, that God open your eyes and see the cobweb. Go and, go and move the cobweb. That's the ministry. He anointed your eyes to see the cobweb. Go and fulfill purpose. <laughs> but that's true. Many times God reveals things to us for us to do something about it. We ought to be saying we complain. Well, I wonder what we're going to do. What are we going to do about it? I'm going to quote from a secular song. We want action, not a bag of mouth. <laughs> God wants us to be people who not only talk the talk, but walk the walk. And a powerful declaration by the angels. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. The whole earth. Not a quarter of the earth. Not half the earth. Not even three quarters of the earth. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Some Bible commentators believe that this is an acknowledgement of, God, of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's an opinion out there. Not, that's a three time holy. God's holiness is, a, is it will not change. God's holiness is not meant to intimidate us, but rather it serves as a reminder that we really need. His grace and mercy. Day by day, moment by moment, God, I need your grace and your mercy. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Where would I be without your grace, Lord? Where would I be without your mercy? Hallelujah, hallelujah, Lord. I thank you, I thank you, I thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. Mm, hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise God. Hallelujah. Let's go on. Verse 4. And the sound of the voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook. And the temple was filled with smoke. Verse 5, please. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and live among a people of unclean lips. 
and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Again, Jeremy, um, Isaiah is seeing a vision. Things are unfolding in front of him. And, in the, and as, he, as, he gets a, as he gets a revelation of God's holiness, I just love his response. Woe to me, I cried, I'm ruined. I'm a man of unclean, I'm a man of unclean lips. And, I'm, and I, I want to stop right there. As I became introspective, he first looked in. He saw his own unworthiness bef before he saw the unworthiness of others. Very often, or it's very easy to see the sins of others and the faults of others rather than looking at ourselves. And, and I'm not saying we should ignore issues and because the Bible says we should look out for others and and help restore us. But God wants us to be the first sacrifice on the altar. He's speaking to me first. Speaking to you first. There are many people who can only see sin in the church. Not sin in their lives. Sin among the, in the nation. Not in, this, in their lives or their family's lives. I was remembering the religious leaders in Jesus' time and how often he clashed with them because of their self-righteous behavior. They were very good at pointing out the faults of others and who didn't fulfill the law and who wasn't doing that and who was doing that. And Jesus was always pointing out the hypocrisy. That's why he could tell them, you who without sin cast the first um, stone. And that's why none of them could cast the stone because they realized that they had faults that they were hiding behind. We can, we can hide behind titles. We can hide behind the knowledge of the word. We can hide behind even our anointing and our charisma. But God wants our heart. God is concerned about you, the individual, about me, the individual. And he's also concerned about his church. But we make up the church. Let's start with ourselves and then be our brother's keeper. Isaiah said, I am un I'm ruined. I'm a man from a man of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the king, the Lord. Um, sorry, I should back up a little bit. Sorry. Woe to me, I'm cried. I'm ruined. I'm from a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips. He was aware of the shortcomings of people, but he wasn't concerned. That wasn't his primary concern. He knew he had to set his house in order before he went out and addressed the needs and the concerns of others. Then one of the servants flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongues from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Jesus, so the Lord did not leave him in a state of condemnation. He knew that he had his shortcomings. And then the angel came and touched him. We are not holy in our own strength. That's why we have the Holy Spirit to help us. Many of us try to be holy, righteous. We have to live the, the Christian life on our own. It ain't made, it ain't made to work like that, you know. 
Jesus said when he was going up there, he said, I will send you the comforter. Who will lead you all truth. Who will empower you to be witnesses. Some of us struggle with guilt. Some of us walk in condemnation. When we should be walking in freedom. I will come read that again. Some of us struggle with guilt. Some of us walk in condemnation. When we should be walking in freedom. I don't care what your past was. Jesus dealt with that. On Calvary once. You confessed your sins and repented. Christ dealt with that. Some of us have made mistakes. You may have wrong on it. I said this morning, you go, you ask for forgiveness. You can't force people to forgive you. But you have done your part. Walk in freedom. Many people think that because they haven't forgiven you, God hasn't forgiven you. My Bible doesn't tell me that. My Bible says that if I confess my sins, he is faithful and just to forgive me and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. So I don't need to go around feeling it. Oh, I did that. I was the worst sin ever. I did so many bad things in my life. I hope I did. I, I, I could write all the wrongs I did. Nobody knows all I've done. Stop throwing a pity party and walk in freedom. Walk in the joy of the Lord. Come on, man. Experience the joy of the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. I'm actually laughing at myself too right now. Because all the time I wanted where my mask was. And I just felt it was underneath here. I thought it fell on the blue or something. Just laughed. <laughs> Hallelujah. Verse 8. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. God didn't just show up for Isaiah to have a nice time. To say, Oh, God spoke. And it was a nice revelation I have for me to record or to tell people about. God showed up because he had a plan. And Isaiah was an integral part of that plan. It was all, it was like, if we, it was a, like a period of preparation for Isaiah. And then Isaiah, after his revelation of God, his holiness, and the state of his people, he, as if he became so burdened. And you go on to respond and say, Lord, here am I. Send me. In the midst of all that is going on, we need to remember that people need Jesus. The world is still looking for answers. The, Lord, the world is still looking for someone to show them a representation, to show them the truth. And as ambassadors of the truth. What will our response be? Very often is what the government will do. What that will do. What, what the elders will do. What whoever, whoever. What will you do? <laughs> what will I do? Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. And then, if we read the end of the chapter, you will see all that went on. Some of us feel inadequate. Maybe we haven't 
studied enough. We don't think we know enough Bible and everything. The Holy Spirit prepares you. And I was saying that you're not to go and study, not to go and, and get trained, anything like that. That all has its, play, uh, its place. But the Holy Spirit is the best teacher. We have to position ourselves to learn and also ask for help if we know you need help. Some of us are too proud to say we don't know to do something. Ask for help. Nothing wrong with that. When I hear to speak to those who feel inadequate, the scriptures are full of people who felt they were inadequate and yet God used them. Remember someone called Moses who felt that he was slow of speech and couldn't do that and God used him mightily. Remember someone named Gideon, the least in his clan, an insignificant one. The God used to, to accomplish a phenomenal feat using unconventional methods that could only have come from the heart of God. Remember Esther, an orphan who rose to a position of authority, of influence, I should say, a position of influence, who had the heir to the king, and she was able to lead her people to freedom. That's very much Sister Phil. That was very much God ordained. <laughs> I'm going to ask about leading. I'm going to say, I can't let the, the, the elder do water boy duties. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yes. I can go again. Go another half hour now. <laughs> when God calls you, He prepares you. When God positions you, he wants to have influence. God doesn't call you where he do and, and sets you up to fail. That's something I, I learned a few years ago. If God called you to do something, he doesn't he has to set you up to fail. It's not for you to get boasty. Oh, well, God got me to get chaotic and won't plan and do what he want to do and say, God will show up for me. But work with the Holy Spirit. Work with the resources, network, do what he wants you to do. And he will get the glory. And you will look good too. But not about you, it's about God getting the glory and his purposes coming to fulfillment. As I close, globally, regionally, nationally, there's a lot going on. I want to urge you, brothers and sisters, not to be distracted. Not to get distracted. Keep your eyes on Jesus. The author and the finisher of our faith. The new Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. And the in-between too. Very well, if we forget the in-between, he is in charge of everything. I like that. He's in charge of the process. And whatever God is saying to us in this season, brothers and sisters, let's line up and do what he's calling us to do. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Hallelujah, Lord. I bless you. Come on, let's cry out to God for, for 30 seconds. Hallelujah, Lord. Come on, Lord. Just speak to God. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Oh, Jesus.
Thank you, Lord, because you are a speaking God. You're a God of revelation. And God, we thank you for what you said this morning, this afternoon to us. Lord, you've been speaking. Lord, I pray that in the midst of all that's going on, that we would attune our ears to you and walk in obedience. Lord, I come against fear right now. In the name of Jesus, Lord, I pray that faith will arise. Lord, let faith arise. Hallelujah, Lord. Let faith arise in our hearts. Lord, I pray for an impact, Lord, as individuals. Lord, I pray for an impact as a church. Lord, whatever you're calling us to, Lord, may we do God wholeheartedly, not half-hearted service. Full service, God, for your glory and for your honor. Lord, we bless you. Lord, we exalt you. We exalt you, King. God, I thank you for moving. I thank you for breathing our fresh. I thank you, God, for, for, for quickening us, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. We bless you, God. We honor you, Lord. And we exalt your majestic name. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. Amen and amen. Praise God. Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah. Ah, yes.